Ukrainian troops are retreating from the eastern city of Severodonetsk after weeks of fierce fighting against invading Russian forces. A regional official said Ukraine's units would move to stronger positions. Recent days have seen Russia make significant gains around the strategic eastern city. Russia is trying to encircle Ukrainian forces and seize the entire Donbass region. Local Ukrainian officials say the fighting is intensifying and nowhere in the east is safe anymore for residents. For more on this, let's cross over now to the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, where DW correspondent Nick Connolly is standing by. Nick, Ukrainian forces, we just heard, beginning to pull out of Severodonetsk. Is this a sign that Kiev admits defeat, at least when it comes to this region? I think it's definitely an acceptance that Severodonetsk was not a city that Ukraine could hold on to with acceptable losses for any longer. It is quite extraordinary, though, how long Ukraine has stayed in control of the city. Experts have been talking about the city being taken by the Russians for basically the best part of a month now, and the Ukrainians just kept on holding on, kept on forcing the Russians to uh, basically uh, lose huge numbers of soldiers, to invest a huge amount of firepower, pulling away uh, weapons and uh, resources from other parts of the front lines just to gain a couple of streets at a time. Uh, and now, in a situation where Severodonetsk is basically the only Ukrainian stronghold on the northern side of that Severodonetsk river, where the bridges behind them have been blown up, Ukraine has now uh, said that they are going to try and pull the people out. How they're going to get them out without bridges, without a situation where there are pontoons, we don't know, but that seems to be the plan now. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a blow, but I think it's a situation where Ukraine basically tried to do the same as it did with Mariupol, to turn this into a Pyrrhic victory for the Russians, a hollow victory where they've basically invested more resources than that city is worth. Uh, but they obviously are desperate for some kind of victory, some kind of gain, because overall, now in our fifth month of war, the Russians have pretty little to show, given the huge resources and given their huge uh, superiority in, in firepower to show for all their efforts. Mm. Now, Nick, do we know where the new positions of the Ukrainian forces are or will be? So the expectation had been that it would be Lysychansk, which is basically Severodonetsk sister city, just on the other side of the riverbank, uh, which has kind of a geography, topography that would make it easier to defend. Because you've got high riverbanks and lots of uh, ways to basically shoot at people trying to get across that river. But we have seen now in recent days the Russians trying to come at Lysychansk from the other side, from the south, in a way that would avoid them having to cross that river. In the past, we've seen the Ukrainians really inflicting huge uh, damage on Russian attempts to cross that river in other places. So a sense that maybe the Ukrainians will have to draw back a little further. But if you just zoom out and look at the bigger picture, these are still pretty small movements over a much bigger front line. The Ukrainians are facing off against the Russians over basically 2,000 kilometers of territory. And overall, Ukraine is still in control of a big chunk of Donbass. It lost most of the ground in the first weeks of the war when it was basically overwhelmed, swamped with attacks uh, all across the country. And now in recent weeks, those movements really haven't been that big. So yes, it is a tactical withdrawal, but in the bigger picture, um, it, Ukraine is still holding on to its main uh, centers, main cities in that part of the country, and it's basically trying to minimize its losses now, uh, unlike the Russians, where we've seen a pretty significant willingness to do pretty risky military maneuvers that have cost the Russian soldiers uh, lots of lives. All right, DW's Nick Connolly, they're reporting from Kiev. Thank you so much. Thousands of people have rallied in the Georgian capital, Tbilisi, to show their support for the former Soviet Republic joining the European Union. Protesters are angry that EU leaders this week refused to grant Georgia candidate status. They're calling on the Georgian government to resign or implement the 12 points listed by the EU for its application to be reassessed. Now, the European Union's decision this week to grant Ukraine candidate status marked what Brussels called the beginning of a long journey that the two sides would walk together. But supporting Ukraine will come at a cost for Europe in the form of soaring energy prices, DW's Christine Mundwa reports. By the time the EU's 27 heads of government began day one of their summit, it was all but certain that they would announce the decision to grant Ukraine candidate status for EU membership a first step in a long process that puts Kiev on the road to Brussels. The importance of this decision for Ukraine cannot be overstated. It is the European Union saying to the embattled country, we want you with us. Just imagine how much of a boost that is to the Ukrainians fighting on the front lines. 
but it was also important for the EU's leadership, who desperately needed a show of unity, and to send a message to Moscow that the entire EU was still strongly in support of Ukraine and its aspiration to join the West. But there is economic trouble in the West, and that dominated day two of the summit's agenda. Inflation is a major concern for all of us. Russia's war of aggression is pushing up the price of energy, food and commodities. And all of this has a direct impact on our citizens and businesses. The EU has sought to isolate Russia for its invasion of Ukraine. And since the war broke out, the bloc has delivered six rounds of sanctions targeted at Russia's economy. EU leaders say Moscow is retaliating by restricting gas supply to the EU. By now, it's 12 member states that either have been totally cut off the Russian gas or partially. And therefore, the best is always hope for the best, prepare for the worst. That's what we're doing right now. The worst case scenario is Russia completely cutting off all of its gas supply to Europe. The impact of that would be devastating for member states like Germany and others whose economies depend on Russia's energy.